And welcome. I'm Bill Newell from MSO News Sports. And uh, Phil Stacy, the executive sports editor of the Salem News, is there nodding his head. And uh, Matt Williams, assistant sports editor of the Salem News, is here. So we've got a we got a light team, if you will. We're traveling light here on uh, this weekend's edition of the program of the podcast. But gentlemen, welcome. Good to see you guys again. Good to see you, Bill. Thanks for having us. Always great. Yeah. Hey, um, let's. We've talked so much about what could happen, what has happened as far as getting ready to make something happen athletically. So now we're at the point here, finally, where we can maybe even talk about. What is happening in the in the days and weeks ahead here, athletically here on the North Shore? Well, Phil and Matt, tell us, give us uh, what you know. Uh, well, we got some golf starting up. In fact, um, today, Saturday afternoon, Bishop Fenwick is hosting the first uh, match on the North Shore. They're hosting Archbishop Williams over at the Meadow and Peabody. And that's the first uh, varsity game that we've had in – what, six and a half months, I guess, since that uh, Wednesday afternoon, second week of March. I can't remember the date off the top of my head, but when um, St. John's Prep played Pope Francis and Beverly played Willie, who was it they played at the Garden? It wasn't Whitman Hanson, was Whitman it? Whitman Hanson, maybe. Yeah, yeah, it might have been them. Yeah, it was Whitman Hanson in boys basketball. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. So it's yeah. been 190 plus days or so since we've had some action, so... Uh, the golfers are back at it. I know Fenwick's got a couple uh, matches this coming week. Swanscott and Beverly begin Northeastern Conference play on Tuesday. Um, I know Hamilton Wenham's playing. I believe Ipswich is playing, Essex Tech. Um, and then we get into some soccer later in the week. You have uh, Essex Tech with a couple of home soccer games. Uh, Fenwick has a field hockey game on Thursday. We get some Cape Ann League cross country. Uh, on Thursday, Salem Academy is going on Thursday, and um, you know by the start of next week, that week of um, October fifth, we'll have pretty much full bore into the Northeastern Conference at that point. Um, so yeah, it's starting, um, and as we've been saying all along here, it's great that it's back, and haven't heard that anybody isn't following the uh, proper safety protocols or whatnot. The games will obviously be different than the uh, practices, but as long as we can keep the contact to an absolute minimum and, you know, uh, set forth, uh, I should say follow the guidelines that have been set forth, and hopefully we have a very successful and uh, coronavirus-free fall one season. Bill, just to pick up on your point, uh, that Beverly basketball game and that, that week English also played at the Garden, but uh, in boys basketball, but it was uh, the 11th of March. So it's really six and a half months since the last um, high school varsity athletic event has uh, transpired. And for, for some schools, it probably would be closer to in, rounded up to seven months, basically, by the time they actually do start with stuff, you know? Yeah, so. I mean, I know Danvers, um, they won't even start practicing until um, next Friday. That's just the way that they worked it out with their, um, you know, superintendent and principal and the school committee and whatnot. So they're uh, starting practice a little bit later than everyone else, which means they won't be playing games for two weeks. So they'll be starting middle of October. Yeah, that's October and, too. Yeah. Right. And yeah. we can see the same thing with schools like Saugus and Winthrop, you know, who hope to be able to play and they have games scheduled, but it's not until later, uh, mid-October that they'd be doing that. So uh, Linfield, too, in the Cape Ann League. Exactly. So that is seven months, basically. So we yeah. can, that's seven months. Yeah. Wow. It's quite the off-season. <laughs> exactly. You know? Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, I don't know how many different ways we can say it, but in these uh, unprecedented times, there's nothing that's off the table. And I think just the fact that we're back playing, I mean, let's think about it. If, if we went back to May and you brought up fall sports, you'd be like, yeah, sure. By then we'll have this thing figured out, you know, no big deal. We'll get it done. And then maybe if you went to July, you'd be thinking, I don't know about this. You know, I'm not so sure we're going to get off the ground here. So the fact that um, we, they are able to play, especially in the Northeastern Conference, where it was said, uh, you know, it was voted on. We're not going to play this fall. And uh, I'm going to let Willie take it from here. But um, the way that the students stood up for themselves, and he, he really has uh, been all over and, and hit on the uh, head on the, the 
nail on the head several times, including this past week, about that. Um, they're now able to play as well as their brethren from the Cape Inland League, Catholic Conference, Catholic Central League, Commonwealth, you know, so on and so forth. Um, you know, we just have to hope it all works out. And really, uh, toot your own home uh, deservedly here, please, about the uh, the column you wrote this past week and kind of summarizing, um, you know, what, what the students, uh, student athletes did for themselves. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of student athletes do a lot of great things over the years, but this, going back to that word, has been unprecedented what they've been able to do for this, themselves. Well, I think, uh, you know, j- just to note, I'm looking at the map here. So Linfield is yellow. They're out. So they're, they're out of the red. They're, they're good to go here once they get their practice time in. So they're, they're probably only a week behind because uh, the first practices were last week. So uh, that's very good news uh, here for Linfield. And, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I think – that's the part about the toot and the horn is sort of why I wrote what I wrote this week. You guys can check it out on, on the website there. And, and, you know, certainly we had some strong things to say when the principals made their decision and uh, you know, we, we've gotten some, some credit in some circles. Wow. You know, the things you guys wrote really, uh, you know, hit home and, and sparked action. And, and so I, I you know, I, I kind of says, well, I think it was really the kids that did it. It wasn't us. Right. I mean, that's just sort of our style in Salem uh, at the news, uh, the defer and, you know, the players play, so to speak. And, and uh, you know, we, what, what we write maybe counts as play calling, coaching, you know, whatever, but uh, you know, the way these kids conducted themselves, uh, you know, nobody could have blamed them if they were really mad and, and acted immaturely. I mean, Hey, they're immature. They're kids. They're not allowed to drink. Uh, most of them aren't even allowed to vote at this point yet, uh, you know, the vast majority of these athletes won't be able to vote in the upcoming election, right? Cause they won't be 18 yet in November. And, and yet they still got involved in the civic process here and, you know, were very mature and, and, you know, uh, asked to be allowed to, to let play and, and really organize themselves. I mean, they may have been inspired by something they read in the newspaper or online or, or, you know, some group chats with their parents or whatever, but, you know, this, this wasn't people that were following instructions from adults. This was young people that were taking action and, and taking things in, in their own hands. And, and, you know, I think beyond uh, sports, right. What, what I really like about it is that they've seen that, uh, you know, w- when they take action, uh, uh, they can affect change. Right. And so this is now going to be a whole bunch of people that go to college. And if they see something they don't like, maybe aren't going to be afraid to, to ask for some changes and to try to affect some changes. This is, you know, when they get uh, older, they're going to be able to do that same thing, you know? And so that to me is, is really nice. Uh, uh, you know, a, a whole maybe new generation of people that are, that are going to be instead of disenfranchised with, with, you know, the structures of power and whatnot are, are going to be enfranchised and, and faithful. And, and so it's just really, uh, really, really nice to see. I think as a byproduct of that too, Willie, is that, a lot of these student athletes either were would have been part of uh, spring sports teams that weren't able to play. Their seasons were canceled, or maybe even further to the point, saw seniors on those teams that had that season taken away from them. And if you're a senior this year, you don't want your seasons taken away from you. And they figured, hey, those guys uh, and girls didn't have the chance to say, well, we want to play, let's, you know, stand up for ourselves here. Uh, Maybe they were empowered by those seniors in the spring who weren't able to speak for themselves. And if that's the case, I give them uh, all the credit in the world because they're following the lead of those uh, that came before them, even if it was only one year in school ahead of them or two years in school ahead of them. But they, uh, you know, they, I'm sure they saw how difficult it was on those seniors and decided that, uh, you know, if it was going to happen to them, they were going to get on fighting, so to speak. And, and good on them for standing up and uh, for what they believe in and, and making change happen. Well, we say it all the time uh, in the Student Athlete Award, but, I mean, these are the leaders, right? Th- these are not, um, you know, this is not the 80s. Uh, the, the, you know, these athletes are not your, uh, you know, moose on the football team who, who doesn't know uh, how to do two plus two, right? I mean, these kids... Wait a uh, minute. I was an athlete in the 80s. I, I was uh, a high school athlete in the Stereotypes. 80s. I'm, okay. saying, I'm saying the ones you see on TV, you know, from, from Happy Days or Saved by the Bell or whatever, yeah. you know, like, 
Yeah. Matt, Matt, boy, Matt, what a slip up on your part. I mean, oh my goodness. Yeah. Can we do this right, over? Right Can we take do it? Give, right around the time I have to give him a review too. Oh, well, I'm sure that, uh, you know, that'll be uh, strong to quite strong, uh, you know, uh, you know, 10 cents uh, in the candy machine or, or whatever. But, uh, you know, no, these are the leaders, right? These are our future leaders. These are the kids that are, are well-spoken and, and well-rounded. And, and, you know, for those people that would say, what do we need sports for? We're in a pandemic. I would say uh, this is exactly what we need the sports for, okay? This is, you know... To, to teach this kind of thing is, is so much more important than, you know, some chemistry folder or uh, reading the great Gatsby for the 17th time, uh, in my opinion, anyway, because this is real world stuff. And uh, this is the stuff that kids are not going to forget uh, when they get older, you know? Um, so let me summarize this. So you breeze through high school, Matt. So you figure, well, they don't really need all this stuff, but they, they got to have the athletic stuff, but, uh, well, but you know, but but you know what? Let me just follow up. I'll let you respond to that. Uh, I'm just kidding. But uh, you know what? What I think was great is to how the athletes themselves did it in a very low, understated way. They went out there. They were polite. They were friendly. They were just they just made their case. And I also got to give school committees credit too for listening to them. And all this stuff fell right into place, as you reported, Matt, over the last couple of weeks. School committees listened, uh, and they took votes. And you know, it's interesting. Uh, Maybe not everyone agreed, but they did vote and they gave, they let the process move forward with the opportunity to see if they can pull this off. And I think that, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I think that's, that was a really good sign too. Cause you know, I could have easily seen this not going. I mean, I think we even talked about it when it was happening. It's like, yeah, there's a nice little action by these student athletes that, that would, they did it well, but you know, is it going to really result in anything? And it did, it really did result in something. So I think that's a win-win for, Again, the athletes and also the school committees. Matt, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh no, I, I was just joking with you, Bill. But I, no, I agree <laughs> totally, and and I think um, you know it, it was because it, we've seen a lot of times principals at schools make questionable decisions, and, and usually they just kind of put their heads in the sand and and you know they get their way, right? And so I guess uh, since we've been hard on the MIAA over the years, we have to uh, tip our cap to them because the way they designed this to, to run through the school committees uh, really worked. So, uh, you know, I don't know if that's a happy accident or, or if they really kind of had a feeling that these committees would, would have more sense and do a better job. But uh, Hey, the way the MIA came up with this, uh, worked really well. So uh, kudos to them. You know, what's funny too, is I think the prevalent thought when the Northeastern conference in late August initially said, you know what, we are not playing this fall. We're going to push it to fall, too. And there was the inevitable, well, what golf courses are going to be open in late February? And how are you going to play, you know, field hockey and whatever? Um, I think the prevalent thought was that, oh, this is going to be the first domino to fall. We're going to see a lot of other uh, conferences around the state do the same thing. It actually was quite the opposite. In fact, if any domino were to fall, and uh, Willie brought this up in, in his piece this week, um, you got to give it a mass economic regional. They were the first school to step up and say, no, you know what? I think it's okay. We can do this and we're going to give it a shot. And everyone else in the conference either uh, immediately or gradually said, you know what? Yeah, they're right. There's no reason we can't do this. So um, it's funny how that uh, well, funny in a good way, how that worked out where the domino that fell wasn't the, the conference itself and everyone following their lead not to play this season, but Mask and Ahmed having the uh, gumption and the foresight to say, you know, we can make this work. You know, there's a safe way to do this. If we follow guidelines and we're responsible, we can do this. And uh, most of the schools, at least, uh, in fact, all of those who have been able to uh, in the conference, um, been given the go ahead on and red to do so have followed suit. So that's, uh, that's great. It, it played out a lot like college football, right? The NEC was the Big Ten. And uh, they thought everyone else was going to follow them. And, and just like the Big Ten, nobody followed. And, and now the Big Ten and the Pac-12 are going to play. And they're just going to be late, you know, from everyone else because they got met with such backlash and everything. So uh, it played out a lot like college football. And, and I can't blame the athletes in the NEC or in college football because it's like if you see your neighbors doing something, uh, you want to do it too, you know. And I guess yeah. – from a maturity standpoint, it's like, uh, you know, wanting to know, hey, mom, uh, 
if Susie in my class uh, can go to the movies uh, by herself, how come I can't kind of thing, you know? Well, that brings up another point too. And I haven't been really following what happens in, in a lot of other states in terms of this, but you hear that football's being played in what, 33 or 35 different states at the high school level. You, had, like New Ham- you had New Hampshire open up last night uh, with their season and we don't have football um, here. Which I understand to a point, you know, it, it's it's difficult, especially with the close proximity. These aren't NFL players that can be tested all the time and things like that. But um, just for me personally, who's been doing this for 30 years, it's still strange to have a Friday night or a Saturday afternoon where you're not getting ready to go to a ball game. So um, I don't know. That that's still I think because that's still fresh and ongoing. And with New Hampshire opening last night. Uh, it brings it a little more to the forefront, at least for me, that like, oh, yeah, we still don't have football. But uh, so I really hope we can pull that off in uh, in the fall two season. But I don't know how you guys feel about it. I mean, you're out as many games as I am in the fall. Uh, I, I, go ahead, Bill. You know, what I was thinking is um, the, you know, I, you know, you were just complimenting the MIAA and I would have too. I mean, but hindsight is always twenty twenty, right? And that, um, you know, I think back now and I'm thinking, you know, were they too hasty on this fall, you know, fall two thing for football, but not anything else. And then you think about the college sports and at a college football drives everything. Football's the big, the big ticket. It's the big money sport. And they're playing football at the colleges, but they're not playing it here in Massachusetts for high school football. And I'm just thinking, you know, a couple of things here is that, you know, it just, these, these athletes that, you know, like a, a traditional high school athlete might play football, basketball, baseball. And now these players, these seniors right now, these current seniors missed out on baseball. They'll miss out on football. And I, I'm sorry, fall two is not going to be that. I don't think it's going to be as good. You know, it's not going to be that great because I'm, I'm worried about the weather and snow and all these conditions. I just, you know, it may work out great and I hope it does. But and then base the sp- spring sports that's going to be diluted again a little bit. Um, so I mean they definitely are, go- are going to be uh, hit hard for a year and a half here for sports. And again, it's nobody's fault. I'm not blaming anybody. I think you know all these decisions I, are the right decisions. I get it, but they are taking quite a hit. And uh, I know Vermont's doing what seven on seven football. You know, in some of these, you know, sports have changed a few of the numbers on the field, and that's. I, I, I don't know if that's the way to go either. So I'm, I'm not criticizing it. It's just one of those things that, you know, you, if you're going to do football in the fall, you've got to know by now anyways. And, and you know, they made their mind up. And I, I'm not saying it's the wrong decision. Matt? I mean, I, you know, personally, I think they could have. Uh, you know, we certainly, to, to not be in action by Thanksgiving, I think is kind of <laughs> crazy, right? But in the climate politically that we have in this state, it wasn't going to happen. So they sacked it. Uh, so the positive outlook to me is that to see it go off without a hitch in all these other States is going to make it extremely difficult for these people to say with a straight face in February that we can't do this. So I, I, I'm not happy that it's not happening now. I, I think it probably could have, I, I thought that in August, I haven't changed my mind, but I do feel better today that the fall two season will actually happen. Uh, because it's going so well in all these other places, I think they're going to have a hard time telling us that fall two is too dangerous and can't be allowed. Do you think that will change with the weather changing? I mean, technically they would be starting up in the winter and, you know, you you hear uh, so much and I'm certainly not in a a doctor or play one on the podcast, but uh, you know, where it is still cold and flu season more than it would be at the start of a traditional football season. That's where I get a little bit like, you know, I wonder if that's going to affect things or not. I think if you're an anti, if you're looking for a reason to cancel football, I think that's where you would go, right? I think it makes sense. Uh, But I think similarly to the way that the summer sports, the little league, the the camps, things like that, you know, kind of convinced people that we could do soccer and field hockey and cross country and golf here for fall one. I think similarly, you know, hopefully the, the strong football, uh, uh, you know, results elsewhere in the country will, will have that effect uh, for fall two. I mean, it, it would be a real, real shame if they cancel fall two when we could have played in fall one because, you know, there's no time machine. You can't 
ever get that time back. So, uh, you know, it would really stink and, and hopefully it doesn't come to that for, for anybody. And, you know, I mean, I just feel like if you, I've always feared the maturity level of the potential football protests, if football is canceled completely, you know, I mean, if people thought these regular sports protests were, were powerful, I mean, I, I think what we'll see if they try to get rid of football that, you know, will pale in comparison. <laughs> You know, I was, I was thinking, I, they were talking about how the virus would go away in the summer at one point. That was a theory, which apparently isn't true, because uh, we've gone through the summer and we still have the virus. But uh, think about Thanksgiving. Was it two years ago or three years ago when we had the, the uh, zero degrees and the 40 mile per hour winds? It was a brutal day. I can't imagine a virus being out there on a day like that. I may be wrong, but you know what I mean? Uh, you know, I'm Maybe maybe I have the virus all wrong, but if I were a virus, I would not be out on that kind of a weather. You could probably play football that day. But you could have an awful small overcoat. Maybe uh, <laughs> Santa makes those. Yeah. But hey, since we go ahead, Phil. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I was going to say um, two things. I wonder, uh, or I've been thinking about this. If there's anyone who would have normally played football. But instead, you know, they said, you know what, I'm going to run cross country or I'm going to play soccer or golf. I guess those would be the three options. So I wonder if we would see a four sport athlete this year. Yeah. Um, well, gonna, what's that? I was going to say the converse of that. Uh, every soccer player, boys and girls, uh, could become a kicker. Yeah, that's true. Perfect. I know. That's great. So I mean, I don't, know, don't they, think don't think there aren't a few football coaches out checking out some soccer games this fall out there. Yeah. Well, you know, perfect example of that. And now he's a, you know, a highly recruited and regarded kicker at Bentley University was uh, Luke Samperi of Beverly. Yeah. Uh, Luke was a soccer player up until his senior year of high school. Decided to come out for football. Yeah. A lot of his buddies played football. Beverly goes on to win the North title, uh, thanks in large part to his kicking and punting. <laughs> Uh, played a crucial role on that team. So I don't think that's so far-fetched. Phil, who was the kid a few years ago who had a very similar background? Soccer player, came out to play football for Beverly. This was oh, maybe, uh, maybe a decade ago, you know. Yeah, I want to say he was like Armenian. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Armando uh, Cuco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it Cuco? Armando Cuco? I mean, he was he was a great kicker. He kicked in Division One at UMass. I, I don't know if yeah. he was a soccer player, but – um he's the last great kicker before luke that i can remember at beverly uh, that's that's him i'm pretty sure yeah. yeah absolutely yeah the other thing i was going to mention is you know we're talking about uh football and fall two season does that have a better chance of playing than maybe the traditional winter season where football as we know is going to be outside you know no matter what the weather is that's outdoors whereas hockey and basketball and indoor track uh, and wrestling and whatnot, those are all inside, which, uh, you know, the one sport this fall that would have been played inside volleyball is with the exception of Bishop Fenwick and, and the Amber's hopes that they can play. But uh, with the exception of those sports, that's been moved to fall too because of uh, it's supposedly so much more contagious inside. So do we really run the risk of losing the winter season? Yeah. Hope not. Good I mean, point. Yeah, it's a good. I mean, I guess that would be a decision that you know it's a good. It's a, would be on the table moving forward for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been going along and and saying that you know, geez, if things go well in the fall one season, and you know, everyone follows protocols and there's no slip ups or whatnot, you know, that's going to allow everyone else that much better of a chance of playing these other seasons. But when you move it inside, it does make you think like, well, that's kind of a different ball game and. Um, I don't know if the rules are different or not. I, I certainly hope not, uh, selfishly as a writer and as a fan, because the winter season is terrific. But um, I digress. Yeah, with the numbers as low as they are, though, I, I think, you know, if they stay this low, we'll be okay. I mean, you're seeing the state start to push back on some of the remote learning now in the districts that are, you know, very, very not red. So I think uh, – as long as the numbers stay low, uh, the appetite's going to be there to be a little more permissive here as time goes on. Yeah, we'll learn a lot more in the next two months, really, before we they have to make those decisions. Hey, in our in our last few minutes, I want to ask you guys. Um, we because we haven't until really this week talked a lot about football, or we've done a little bit of football talk here this weekend. But uh, you guys are running a series on here's what happened on this day 
in football five years ago, 10 years ago in the Salem News. So I thought maybe I'd ask you two guys whether there's something you dug up in your research from on this date, five, 10, whatever years ago, 15, I guess it is, or more, but uh, whatever the date was, you know, something that you kind of like, oh, I didn't, I'd forgotten about that, or, you know, those kinds of things that, uh, that have happened in sports, because you both have been there for, for a few years now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say so. I mean, you know, going back and finding the dates, um, that was the first part of the process, like uh, what days of the week were Fridays and Saturdays, and, um, you know, marked on those dates, and then go back and look and see you know, you always want to have a piece of art, a photo from one of the games. We usually try to put three different games in there every um, every time we do this date in football history. Um, three games from three different years. So, you know, we obviously have a lot of photos um, in our system from, say, like the past 15, 20 years. Beyond that, it gets a little shaky. I mean, when we were actually printing digital, I mean, uh, non-digital photos. Uh, they were hard copies. A lot of those got lost during various moves we've had and whatnot. Um, but we have all the scores dating back to, God, what, the early uh, 19th, uh, 20th century, I should say, uh, or late 19th century in some of those cases, Salem and Beverly, uh, Danvers, DVD, be up there. So um, just trying to rotate it, basically. But yeah, there have definitely been some like, oh, yeah, I remember that game. Or if you look at the archives and um, you know, either games that Willie played in when he was at Peabody High or, you know, that I covered in the uh, 90s when I was starting out, 1990, things like that. Um, game I haven't thought about for years and years and years comes back to me. You know, you read a story of my byline on I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember that kid. And <laughs> he was a pretty good player and all. So um, that's been a nice little trip down memory, memory lane. You know, memory lane. I should say that for anybody listening to the podcast, if you have a uh, special game or a date uh, that uh, was always near and dear to you, football-wise, uh, that you want to send us, feel free. You can email me at the newspaper or send me a tweet, um, and we'll try to get that in for you because we want to try to mix it up for all of our teams that we cover and put in a lot of different names and photos of different players from uh, yesteryear. So uh, I got one recently from um, down in uh, Texas. Um, somebody that I've become friends with, uh, former Salem High player who played in the 60s, um, sent me something that says, oh, you know, we upset uh, Lynn English on this day and blah, 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 blah. And he sent me the actual newspaper clip he still had, you know, from, what's that, 55 years ago now. So we were able to run the actual, old, the original photo as it appeared in the newspaper, along with that 65 Salem English game. And I thought that was great. So if anybody else has a, uh, a game like that old clips old photos that you want to send us please do so we'd be happy to uh, run it in the newspaper matt how yourself on on any of this i think we lost matt here for matt sure, do you want yeah, to i mean you know like we were saying before uh, can you hear me i yeah. hear you yeah i hear you yeah Ah, so, I mean, like we were saying before, these kids that they don't remember their chemistry lessons. I mean, so, but they remember uh, sports, right? So, uh, you know, all, all the uh, game that I would uh, never have forgotten about is that uh, Ray LaMonica interception return, you know, 20 years uh, this week. I was just going to post the video on Twitter for the anniversary, but since it's a pandemic and there are no sports allowed, I, I figured I'd write uh, 1,400 words about uh the game and you know all those guys on that team I mean I remember every starter every you know most of the backups I mean you know so that was uh, certainly fun and uh, just want to point out to all the people out there uh, we don't want to just write about uh, our own indulgences right uh, you know so if there's a nice round number and you can think of an important game that maybe you played in or whatever from you know 1980 85 90 95 2000 uh, let us know, you know, shoot us a tweet, shoot us uh, an email. And uh, we're certainly looking for other ideas for anniversary stories uh, from your different sports too. You know, just like Phil mentioned the uh, anniversaries of the games, uh, you know, on this date, a game you remember, I mean, let us know if it's been 20 or 25 or 30 or 35 years since a big game that you remember, uh, you know, we'd love to dig into it and, and, and come up with some kind of uh, oral history or something, you know, those are just so much fun to do. Uh, 
you know, to, to, and to see that the other guys in those games uh, remember everything uh, just the way that you do, you know, it's, uh, it's really fun and uh, makes it feel good that uh, what we do is important, right? Because people remember it, uh, you know, that's, that's why there's passion on the North shore. That That's why uh, these things, uh, people love still talking about those old games and we're very fortunate to live somewhere and work somewhere where uh, that's the case. Hey, I got to close it out because time is short, but I want to share, you mentioned the chemistry class and we had the anniversary of Monday night football uh, this past week. And I do remember the very first Monday night football game. I was taking chemistry at the time at my high school. And I remember my teacher coming in probably Tuesday morning thinking, these games are kind of running kind of (laughs) late. You know what I mean? He had that tired look on his face or whatever, you know, but it's funny that that one comment I remember because Monday night football, when it started was such a huge deal uh, because it was only football was only Sunday afternoons, you know, and it was such a big deal and a big show on Monday night with uh, Dandy Don and Howard Cosell and the crew. Uh, And, and so I just remember that I don't remember my elements that well, but I do remember that one comment from my chemistry teacher. These to something to the extent that these games are, these games are starting a little bit too late or something like that. But uh, that's my, that's my uh, contribution. I remember the compound GI gridiron. That's what I remember. Oh yeah. <laughs> I can tell I'm, you the, fir- the first time I was allowed to stay up for Monday night football was uh, when Bill Parcells came back to Foxborough with the jets. So other than that, you had to go to bed. You got it. 